I'm Larry DeMarco, and thanks for turning in to my second episode of Delaware County Political News Voter Information Network. If you haven't seen my first episode, please check it out, where I discussed how in these times of political turmoil, we should take advantage of the internet to gain information, network, and take action. In this show, I want to discuss the media. One issue that President Trump has reintroduced to the public is the fact that the media have an ability to distract and mislead to further its own agenda, whatever that agenda may be. Now, this complaint has become such a common refrain in the past two years that after a while, I started to tune it out. We all know that there are liberal news outlets and conservative news outlets. But then I started to wonder if maybe there wasn't something more to it than just that. I asked myself, is it true? Is the media really as bad as Trump says? Does the media really have its own deep hidden agenda that so dramatically distorts its message that we can't rely on its information? And if it's true, what negative effects does this have on us? What does it all mean? So I decided to investigate the issue further. And today, I want to share with you what I've discovered. Unfortunately, what I found is quite disturbing. It's become increasingly clear that the media has the same agenda as the elite ruling class in society against which it's supposed to be acting as a watchdog. And their power to influence a story can have negative, dramatic implications to society at large. That's why in this episode, I'm going to show you why the media deliberately distorts the truth, how they coercively influence public policy and behavior, and what the political, social, and economic consequences have been across the country and in our own backyard here in Delaware County. Please note this issue cuts across party lines. This is done by the elites, Democrats and Republicans alike, whomever is in power in a particular community. Today, I'll provide examples from the New York Times and CNN, which are major world news outlets, to illustrate this disturbing process and show you where even the smallest local newspapers, including our very own Town Talk here in Delaware County, have been identified as having similar influences and conflicts of interest. The first thing I realized in researching Trump's complaints against the media is that he appeared to be quoting Noam Chomsky. He's a philosopher, historian, social critic, and political activist, among other things. As we know, Trump gets a lot of what he knows from television. And in Noam Chomsky's documentary, Manufacturing Consent, he explained that the media uses a subtle propaganda model of communication to almost brainwash the public into thinking in conformity with the best interests of the elite of society a group of wealthy and politically powerful individuals, both liberal and conservative, who own the media and make decisions for the rest of society. First, Professor Chomsky identifies these groups and how they exert their power and influence. Societies differ, but in ours, the major decisions over what happens in the society, decisions over investment and production and distribution and so on, are in the hands of a relatively concentrated network of major corporations and conglomerates and investment firms and so on. They are also the ones who staff the major executive positions in the government, and they're the ones who own the media, and they're the ones who have to be in a position to make the decisions. They have an overwhelmingly dominant role in the way life happens, you know, what's done in the society. Within the economic system, by law and in principle, they dominate. The control over resources and the need to satisfy their interests imposes very sharp constraints on the political system and uh, the ideological system. The national media sets an agenda that the rest of the local media adheres to. Major news sources like the New York Times and CNN have a special role to create history and shape history by how they frame the stories they report. And they do this in all sorts of ways, by selection of topics, by distribution of concerns, by emphasis and framing of issues, by filtering of information, by bounding of debate within certain limits. 
45 seconds. They determine, they select, they shape, they control, they restrict uh, in order to serve the interests of dominant elite groups in the society. And how does the elite control the media? No need to control. They are one and the same. So what we have in the first place is major corporations, which are parts of even bigger conglomerates. According to his research, in 1992, 23 major corporations owned and controlled over 50% of the media outlets in the United States, including movie studios, TV stations, radio stations, newspapers, and magazines. In some local areas, the corporation hold a monopoly. And if that's not disturbing enough, fast forward 20 years to 2012, and there's a dramatic consolidation of power. Now, there are just six media giants who control 90% of what we read, watch, or hear. This disturbing trend shows that what was already a gross imbalance of power in the hands of the few from the beginning has gotten even worse. Not so coincidentally, the balance of power and wealth in the country has shifted further away from the middle class into the hands of the very wealthy. This would suggest that there is some correlation between power and wealth and the media. In other words, if these billionaire media companies have the ability to frame the issues and perpetually reinforce the same perspectives through all the media channels, then they can influence our perspective and understanding in a way that allows them to maintain wealth and power. You might be wondering if super powerful billionaire multimedia companies deliberately deceive the public, and if so, what effect the deception has on us. Here are two historic examples. First, CNN's coverage before the first Iraqi war and CNN's failure to provide any analysis or commentary on the United States' ability to avoid the war. This caused the country to slide into an avoidable war with hardly any protests from the public. In an interview, Turner bragged about CNN's 24-hour coverage on the Iraqi war including investigative reporting, commentary, analysis, and in-depth reporting. However, Chomsky rightfully points out that despite the quantity of coverage, CNN failed to cover the fact that the United States could have avoided the war entirely if it wanted to negotiate. But the administration appeared to want unconditional war, as described in the following clip. And by context, I mean the institutional memory that is critical to understand why and how. And that's those who are analysts and do commentary uh, and those who can uh, explain. Uh, going to war is a serious business. In a totalitarian society, the uh, dictator just says, we're going to war and everybody marches. In a democratic society, the theory is that if the political leadership is committed to war, they present reasons and they got a very heavy burden of proof to meet because a war is a very catastrophic affair as this one proved to be. Uh, the role of the media at that point is to uh, allow, is to present the relevant background, for example, the possibilities of peaceful settlement, such as what they may be, have to be presented, and then to present, uh, to offer a forum, in fact, encourage a forum of debate over this very dread decision to go to war and, in this case, kill hundreds of thousands of people and leave two countries wrecked and so on. Uh, that never happened. Uh, the, there was never, uh, well, you know, when I say never, I mean 99.9% .9 of the discussion uh, excluded the option of a peaceful settlement. I mean, every time George Bush would appear and say there will be no negotiations, there would be, you know, 100 editorials the next day lauding him for going the last mile for diplomacy. Uh, if he said, uh, you can't reward an aggressor instead of cracking up and ridicule the way people did in the civilized sectors of the world, like the whole third world. Uh, the media said, oh man, a fantastic principle, you know, the invader of Panama, the only head of state uh, stands condemned for aggression in the world, the uh, guy who was head of the CIA during the Timor aggression, you know, he says aggressors can't be rewarded. The media just applauded. People don't want a war unless you have to have one. And they would have known that you don't have to have one. Well, the media kept people from knowing that. Uh, and that means we went to war very much in the manner of a totalitarian state. 
thanks to the media subservience. That's the big story. A second example. The failure to cover a news story is just as significant as how a story is covered. In 1975, the media covered genocide committed by the Khmer Rouge in Cambodia. Yet the press never mentioned the fact that the United States participated in war crimes and genocide against East Timor by selling arms to the Indonesia army at exactly the same time as explained in this next clip. What's the reason why one incident was covered and one was ignored? Well, the United States was the war criminal in one and blameless in the other. Watch this next. The Rouge are the most genocidal people on the face of the earth. Peter Jennings reporting from the killing fields, Thursday. I mean, the great act of genocide in the modern period is Pol Pot, 1975 to, through 1978. That atrocity, I think it would be hard to find any example of a comparable outrage and outpouring of fury and so on and so forth. So that's one atrocity. Well, it just happens that in that case, history did set up a controlled experiment. Have you ever heard of a place called East Timor? I uh, can't say that I have. Where? <laughs> East Timor? Nope. No, huh? Well, it happens that right at that time, there's another atrocity, very similar in character, but differing in one respect. We were responsible for it, not Pol Pot. East Timor was a Portuguese colony. Indonesia had no claim to it, and in fact stated that they had no claim to it. Ford and Kissinger visited Jakarta, I think it was December 5th. We know that they had requested that Indonesia delay the invasion until after they left because it would be too embarrassing. And within hours, I think, after they left, the invasion took place on December 7th. This council must consider Indonesia's aggression against East Timor as the main issue of the discussion. When the Indonesians invaded, the UN reacted as it always does, calling for um, sanctions and condemnation and so on. Various watered-down resolutions were passed, but the U.S. was very clearly not going to allow anything to work. By 1978, it was approaching really genocidal levels. The church and other sources estimated about 200,000 people killed. Uh, the U.S. backed it all the way. The U.S. provided 90% of the arms. Uh, right after the invasion, arms shipments were stepped up. When the uh, Indonesians actually began to run out of arms in 1978, the Carter administration moved in and increased arms sales. And other Western countries did the same. Canada, England, Holland, and everybody who could make a buck was in there trying to make sure they could kill more Timorese. There is no Western concern for issues of aggression, atrocities, human rights abuses, and so on, if there's a profit to be made from them. Uh, nothing could show more, it more clearly than this case. It wasn't that nobody had ever heard of East Timor. Crucial to remember that there was plenty of coverage in the New York Times and elsewhere before the invasion. The reason was that there was concern at the time over the breakup of the Portuguese Empire and what that would mean. There was a fear that it would lead to independence or Russian influence or whatever. After the Indonesians invaded, the coverage dropped. Uh, there was some, but it was strictly from the point of view of the State Department and Indonesian generals, never a Timorese refugee. As the atrocities reached their maximum peak in 1978, when it really was becoming genocidal, coverage dropped to zero in the United States and Canada, the two countries have looked at closely, literally dropped to zero. All this was going on at exactly the same time as the great protest of outrage over Cambodia. The uh, level of atrocities was comparable. In relative terms, it was probably considerably higher in Timor. It turns out right in Cambodia in the preceding years, 1970 through 1975, there was also a comparable atrocity for which we were responsible. The major U.S. attack against Cambodia uh, started with the bombings of the early 1970s. They reached a peak in 1973, and they continued up till 1975. They were directed against inner Cambodia. Very little is known about them because the media wanted it to be secret. They knew it was going on, they just didn't want to know what was happening. The CIA estimates about 600,000 killed during that five-year period, which is mostly either U.S. bombing or a U.S.-sponsored war. 
So that's pretty significant killing. But also the conditions in which it left Cambodia were such that high US officials predicted that about a million people would die in the aftermath just from hunger and disease because of the wreckage of the country. Pretty good evidence from US government sources and scholarly sources that the intense bombardment was a significant force, maybe a critical force, in building up peasant support for the Khmer Rouge, who before that were a pretty marginal element. Uh, well, that's just the wrong story. After 1975, atrocities continued, and that became the right story, because now they're being carried out by the bad guys. Well, it was bad enough. In fact, current estimates are that, well, you know, they vary. I mean, the CIA claim 50 to 100,000 people killed and uh, maybe another million or so who died one way or another. Michael Vickery is the one person who's given a really close, detailed analysis. His figure is maybe 750,000 deaths above the normal. Others, like Ben Kiernan, suggest higher figures, but so far without a detailed analysis. Anyway, it was terrible, no doubt about it. Although the atrocities, the real atrocities, were bad enough, they weren't quite good enough for the uh, purposes needed. Within a few weeks after the Khmer Rouge takeover, the New York Times was already accusing them of genocide. At that point, maybe a couple hundred or maybe a few thousand people had been killed. And from then on, it was a drumbeat, a chorus of uh, genocide. The big bestseller on Cambodia, uh, Pol Pot, is called Murder in a Gentle Land. Up until April 17, 1975, was a gentle land of peaceful, smiling people. And after that, some horrible holocaust took place. Very quickly, a figure of two million killed was hit upon. Uh, in fact, what was claimed was that the Khmer Rouge boast of having murdered two million people. Facts are very dramatic. Uh, in the case of atrocities committed by the official enemy, extraordinary show of outrage exaggeration, no evidence required, faked photographs are fine, anything goes. Also, a vast amount of lying. I mean, an amount of lying that would have made Stalin cringe. It was fraudulent, and we know that it was fraudulent by looking at the response to comparable atrocities for which the United States was responsible. There was uh, a story in the London Times, which is pretty accurate. The New York Times revised it radically. Then just leave a paragraph out. They revised it and gave it a totally different cast. It was then picked up by Newsweek, uh, giving it the New York Times cast. It ended up being a whitewash, whereas the original was an atrocity story. Now, in whose interests uh, is the history being so shaped? Well, I think that's not very difficult to answer. Now, to eliminate confusion, all of this has nothing to do with liberal or conservative bias. According to the propaganda model, both liberal and conservative wings of the media, whatever those terms are supposed to mean, fall within the same framework of assumptions. Uh, in fact, if the system functions well, it ought to have a liberal bias, or at least appear to, because if it appears to have a liberal bias, that will serve to balance thought even more effectively. In other words, if the press is indeed adversarial and liberal and all these bad things, then how can I go beyond it? They're already so extreme in their opposition to power that to go beyond it would be to take off from the planet. So therefore, it must be that the presuppositions that are accepted in the liberal media are sacrosanct, can't go beyond them. Uh, and a well-functioning system would, in fact, have a bias of that kind. The media would then serve to say, in effect, thus far and no further. The coverage, or lack of coverage of the situation in East Timor, illustrates how the media's blatant disregard for the facts can perpetuate genocide and cause an otherwise civilized society, in this case the United States, to become responsible for hundreds of thousands of lives. You see, the knowledge of genocide by a moral, conscious society would lead to protests, civil disobedience, and pressure through political acti activism to stop the atrocities. Without such knowledge, these war crimes can and did continue for years without any resistance or public outcry whatsoever.
So what do we do when the media plays such a critical role in society and can mislead us so dramatically? We need the media as a watchdog to keep our legislators and politicians honest and to serve as an intermediary between us and our government. This information is how we keep government accountable, not just the institution, but the whole process, the elections, the debates from which we draft our laws, and the communication between us and government. The media are our primary vehicle through which we investigate and prevent abuse. So it's important that the media be free, independent, and impartial. There are alternatives to the mainstream sources, but we have to make a conscious choice to find impartial news sources. There are alternatives to the mainstream sources, but we have to make a conscious choice to find impartial news sources. Thankfully, there's a growing number of independent websites available to anyone with access to the internet. The following is only a sampling of the alternatives to the big six of mainstream media. Most are nonpartisan, independent, and nonprofit. Some are more transparent than others. A few go so far as to outline a code of journalistic ethics that their company follows. The American Press Institute offers a list of multiple independent internet websites and also provides questions to ask while reading to help determine what media to trust. So what's the significance of the power of the media to us locally? What relevance does this have here in Delaware County? Well, a lot. In Chomsky's documentary, Manufacturing Consent, he specifically chose Delaware County as a local comedian that knows the importance of marketing a community. The next clip illustrates that the Town Talk newspaper also feels the pressure to promote the local community, businesses, and government through the pressure to sell ads in its newspaper. Why do you want to make a film about media? Well, such a nice quiet town. It's a beautiful town. <laughs> but we're making a film about the mass media, so we thought, whatever, oh, yeah. what a good place you to come. You want to know where they got the name. So maybe you could start by introducing yourself. Yes, I'm Bowden Senko. I'm the Main Street Manager and the Executive Director of the Media Business Authority. And we are in Media, Delaware County, uh, in the southeastern part of Pennsylvania. Media is called everybody's hometown. The motto was developed as a way to promote the community. We're a very high promotion conscious community. When you walk through media, you'll be treated very well, and you find that people have taken the idea of being everybody's hometown to heart. The uh, local paper, the um, talk of the town. The town talk. <laughs> do you read that? Well, yes, I read the town talk, yes. What, what do you think the difference is between the Wall Street Journal and the, ta the talk? Oh, of well, I mean, the town talk is completely local news, and uh, it's, it's fun, it's nice to read, it's interesting. You read about your neighbors and see what's going on in the school district and things like that. We're in business make bucks, just like the big daily newspapers and just like the big radio stations, and we do quite well, and rightfully so, because we work very hard at it. I just want to show you a copy of the paper here, the way it is this week. It's, it's, it's plastic wrapped on all four sides, weatherproof, and hung on everybody's front door, and many, many times you'll find that this paper runs well over 100 pages a week. This particular edition, you have to remember there are five editions. This happens to be the Central Delaware County edition, which is the edition that covers media Pennsylvania. What you see here now is the advertising and composition department. Say hello, guys, will you? Hi. 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 Uh, and what we're doing now is we're putting red dots, green dots, and yellow dots up on the map, wherever there is a store. Now, the red dots are the stores that don't advertise with us at all. The green dots are the ones that advertise with us every week, and the yellow dots are the ones that would run sporadically. If you have any special now, we have computer mounts of every one of these stores, and what we do is we take the printouts of all the red dots, which are the bad guys, and what our idea is is to turn these red dots into yellow dots and turn the yellow dots into green dots and eventually make them all green dots so 100% of the stores and 100% of the merchants and the service people advertise in our newspaper every week. That way we won't have any more red dots. I guess there'll always be a few red dots, but I have high hopes that there'll be a lot more green ones or red ones. When we're now, like any other corporation, they, they have a product which they sell to a market. Uh, the market is advertisers, that is, other businesses. 
what keeps the media functioning is not the audience. They make money from their advertisers. And remember, we're talking about the elite media, so they're trying to sell uh, a good product, a product which raises advertising rates. And ask your friends in the advertising industry, that means that they want to adjust their audience to the more elite and affluent audience that raises advertising rates. It's not a hard stretch to see that the Delaware County newspapers would have a strong conservative influence with little or no negative news against the government because the county government has been controlled by the Republican Party for over 100 years and the business owners licensed to do business in Delaware County are registered Republican. Even as a general principle, newspapers adopt the agenda of the economic elite for ad money for which they're financially dependent for their survival. And, and as Chomsky explains, editors will adopt the agenda of the local government because the wealthy and the local government are often one and the same. During this Delaware County local election cycle, beware of the news you receive. We will explore examples of how Delaware County actually manufactures consent of its voters right here on this show. Thanks for tuning in. And I look forward to discussing this and future issues with you here on Delaware County Political News, the Voter Information Network.